On the 16th of March, 2009, tragedy struck the life of action star Liam Neeson and his family, and they would never fully recover. Natasha Jane Richardson was an unbelievably talented actress who was loved by all who knew her, until one day, an accident in the mountains abruptly ended her life. You've likely seen a movie she was in, even if you haven't heard of her before. The star-studded actress held an impressive repertoire of films, theater performances, and TV shows spanning way back to 1968. Her career started at the young age of four, where she played a flower girl in her father's film, The Charge of the Light Brigade. You see, fame ran in the family, so it's no wonder she would end up marrying another star like Liam Neeson. Natasha was the daughter of Vanessa Redgrave and director-producer Tony Richardson, and the granddaughter of Michael Redgrave and Rachel Kempson. With this background, it was only natural that Natasha would go on to be an actress. She starred in movies like The Parent Trap, The Handmaid's Tale, Made in Manhattan, and The White Countess, alongside Ralph Fiennes. In 1993, Natasha made her Broadway debut and met Liam Neeson. Despite being married to producer Robert Fox, Natasha admitted to falling very much in love with Neeson. It didn't take long for Fox and Natasha to split up, and on the 3rd of July, 1994, Natasha and Neeson got married. It was the kind of fairy tale love that only comes once or twice in a lifetime. Neeson later reflected on their initial chemistry, saying acting together was like a wonderful kind of dance. I'd never had that kind of an explosive chemistry situation with an actor or actress. The pair's love blossomed over the years, and they brought two children into the world, Michael Richardson in 1995 and Daniel Neeson in 1996. With this kind of everlasting love, the star-crossed lovers could have spent their entire lives together. However, in 2009, the fairy tale came to a sudden and devastating end. Natasha had decided to take skiing lessons at the Mont Tremblant Resort, about 81 miles from Montreal, Canada. She was skiing on a slope alongside an instructor when she suddenly lost her balance. If you've ever been skiing, you know how easy this is to do while trying to stay up as gravity pulls you downhill, especially when you're learning. But for Natasha, this was no small accident. On her way down, she hit her head on the ground. The injury seemed minor at first, with Natasha refusing hospital treatment twice. Unfortunately, Natasha was not wearing a helmet at the time of the accident. Her condition slowly degraded, and she ended up being evacuated to a hospital in Montreal. Neeson later reported that on a phone call to Natasha, she described the accident, saying, Oh, darling, I've taken a tumble in the snow. Neeson flew to meet her from a film set in Toronto, but by the time he arrived, it was too late. The doctor informed Neeson that Natasha was brain dead, showing him an x-ray, which the actor said depicted her brain squashed up against the side of the skull. At this point, Natasha was still hooked up to life support, so he went in to say his final goodbyes. Some of his last words to her were, Sweetie, you're not coming back from this. You've banged your head. It's, I don't know if you can hear me, but that's, this is what's gone down, and we're bringing you back to New York. All your family and friends will come. Years before, the pair had made a pact. If either was in a vegetative state, the plug would be pulled. So, after flying Natasha back to New York, Liam Neeson made what was probably the hardest decision of his life. Just two days after what was supposed to be a fun day on the slopes, he took Natasha Richardson off of life support. After this tragedy, Neeson threw himself into his work, and it took years before he opened up about what happened. He admits that the death never felt real to him, and in the first few years, he was still waiting for her to walk through the door. Grief's like, it hits you. It's like a wave, Neeson continued. You just get this profound feeling of instability. You feel like a three-legged table. Just suddenly, the earth isn't stable anymore. And then it passes and becomes more infrequent. But I still get it sometimes. To this day, Liam Neeson has not remarried. Our next celebrity death is one that shook the world and devastated fans of this talented star. You probably know him from the Fast and Furious franchise, but Paul Walker has a huge list of movies under his belt. But he didn't just act like a car fanatic who knew how to hold his own in a fight. He actually was like that in real life, too. And that's what led to his final horrifying moments. Paul Walker came from a family of achievers. His grandfather, William Walker, was a Pearl Harbor survivor and a Navy middleweight boxing champion. 
while his maternal grandfather commanded a tank battalion in Italy under General Patton during World War II. It's likely this genetic background that led Walker to chase after adventure and thrills. He even owned a legendary collection of 30 custom cars that would leave any car enthusiast drooling. It included cars like the Ford GT, the Ford Shelby Mustang, Eleanor Replica, and, of course, the Nissan Skyline R34 that he drove in the Fast and Furious movies. When Paul wasn't chasing thrills as a speed demon in his custom cars, he was learning a variety of martial arts. His fighting scenes in movies led to a passion for martial arts like jiu-jitsu, taekwondo, jeet kune do, and eskrima. But he wasn't just a tough guy. Paul enjoyed relaxing at home with his daughter, Meadow Rain, surfing near his Huntington Beach abode, walking his dogs, and just driving. Unfortunately, his love for driving in fast cars led him to his terrible demise. It all started with Paul attending a charity known as Reach Out Worldwide during some off time from filming Furious 7. He was known as a philanthropist, so he spent that day at a toy drive for the disaster relief charity. That day's charity event was hosted by Walker and his friend Roger Rodas at a high-performance car shop that they owned together. At 3.30 p.m., Walker and Rodas left the event in high spirits in a Porsche Carrera GT. Rodas was a highly skilled professional driver who knew what he was doing, yet the Porsche Carrera GT was notorious for being hard to handle. The pair set off down the road at a high speed, enjoying some real-life fast and furious moments, but just a few hundred yards from the event, Roger Rodas tragically lost control of the car. Traveling at approximately 100 miles per hour, the car swerved, hit a curb, a tree, a light post, and then another tree before catching fire. The scene was devastating. Those attending the charity event, including Rodas' young son, heard the awful crash and rushed to help. They emptied fire extinguishers on the horrific crash, but the flames were just too intense to be put out. As Paul Walker's friend Antonio Holmes recalled, it was one of the most horrific crash scenes in Hollywood history. It was engulfed in flames. There was nothing. They were trapped. Employees, friends of the shop, we tried. We tried. We went through fire extinguishers. The Porsche was split in half from the crash, and all onlookers could do was watch as it burned. Both Rodas and Walker were consumed by the crash. As news of the accident spread rapidly, fans worldwide were left stunned and heartbroken. Many thought it was a cruel prank due to its similarity to the Fast and Furious franchise, but their hopes were proven wrong. Paul Walker's daughter, Meadow, filed a wrongful death suit against Porsche, claiming the car was unsafe and not fit for the roads. However, a thorough investigation revealed that there were no pre-existing conditions that would have caused the collision and cited worn-out tires and unsafe speeds. There were no alcohol or drugs detected in Walker or Rodas. Paul Walker will forever be a talent that is sorely missed, but there are two quotes from him that give us a somewhat bittersweet ending to the event. Firstly, I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid of living life without ever taking any chances. And, if one day speed kills me, do not cry because I was smiling. Our next tragedy involves Naya Rivera, a popular actress, singer, and model. If you haven't heard of her, she was best known for her role on the hit television series Glee. The circumstances surrounding her death were very sudden, but what makes it strange is that she was one of eight Glee members who passed away. As the sun blazed high on July 8, 2020, actress Naya Rivera and her four-year-old son, Josie Dorsey, set out on what was meant to be a fun barbecue outing by Lake Piru in California. Upon arrival, they spontaneously decided to rent a boat. Setting sail at around 1 p.m., they were expected back by 4 p.m., Three hours later, neither had returned from the excursion. A sense of unease started back at the boathouse, where they hoped it was a simple matter of running out of gas or a small mechanical problem. It wasn't until approximately 5 p.m. that they found the boat floating in the lake. Four-year-old Josie Dorsey was discovered, fast asleep on the boat, his small frame wrapped in a life jacket. Naya's life jacket and identification were found in the boat, too. A 911 call was made, and a formal search and rescue operation was launched. No sign of Naya was found that day. That evening, the Ventura County Sheriff's Office interviewed the young boy, and a chilling tale unfolded. Rivera and her son had jumped into the lake together, but as the boat began to violently rock and drift under the relentless 21-mile-per-hour winds, she ordered Josie back on board. What happened next would haunt the lake's shores for years to come. According to police reports, 
Josie witnessed his mother's desperate struggle as she tried to climb back onto the boat. In the midst of her battle with turbulent waters, she managed to push her son back onto the boat, her maternal instinct overcoming the unforgiving forces of nature. However, as Josie searched for a rope to help his mother, he recalled her reaching up and calling out for help. But tragically, she disappeared underwater. Wearing no life jacket herself, Rivera's chance of survival went down drastically. Authorities speculated that Rivera and Josie had been caught in a treacherous rip current, common in that area of the lake during the afternoon. The unanchored boat may have drifted away from where they had entered the water, leaving Rivera to fight an impossible battle against the forces of nature. In her final moments, it is believed that Rivera mustered every ounce of her strength to save her son, sacrificing herself in the process. The following morning, the lake was closed to the public as an army of divers from across the region joined the hunt. With each passing hour, the sense of urgency grew, and the operation transitioned from a rescue effort to a grim search for Rivera's remains. The number of divers was reduced from 100 to 40, and the focus shifted to utilizing sonar devices to detect any sign of the missing actress. Rivera's family, including her parents, stepfather, brother Michael Rivera, ex-husband Ryan Dorsey, and close friend Heather Morris, gathered at the lake to offer their support. Morris, Rivera's Glee co-star, was determined to conduct her own search along the treacherous shoreline. Five days after Rivera and her son set out, a somber announcement brought a solemn end to the search. A body had been discovered floating in Lake Piru by divers that morning. The sheriff's office revealed that the remains were found just north of Diablo Cove, speculating that they had been trapped in underwater vegetation before resurfacing. As the search for Naya Rivera came to a heartbreaking conclusion, family, friends, and fans around the world mourned the loss of a beloved actress and devoted mother who spent her last moments saving her son's life. South African-born Cliff Simon, an Air Force veteran and international athlete, possessed a captivating presence that set him apart throughout his versatile career. Realizing his dream of becoming a U.S. citizen, Simon lived in Los Angeles since 2000 and was a published author of Paris Nights, My Year at the Moulin Rouge. From a young age, Simon pursued his passion for competitive swimming, aiming to become South Africa's first Olympic gold medalist in the sport. Under his mother's guidance, he honed his skills and achieved national recognition in both swimming and gymnastics. However, at age 15, amid South Africa's turmoil, his family relocated to the United Kingdom, where he continued his athletic journey. Competing in Olympic trials and qualifying for the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, Simon was offered prestigious scholarships to train with the renowned U.S. swim team, the Mustangs. Despite his relentless dedication, he eventually felt burned out and yearned for a change. Returning to South Africa, he joined the Air Force and earned the highest athletic award, the Victor Lodorum. Following his service, Simon embarked on a new adventure in the entertainment industry. Combining his athleticism and charisma, he landed a job as a performer at the iconic Moulin Rouge Theatre in Paris. From there, he went on to travel the world, captivating audiences as a dancer and acrobat in various stage productions. Simon would go on to land and win an audition for the successful television series Egoli, Place of Gold. His six-year stint as a lead actor made him a household name. Seeking a better quality of life and acting opportunities, Simon immigrated to the U.S. with his wife. Soon after, he guest-starred alongside Don Johnson in Nash Bridges and then secured the recurring role of Ball in Stargate SG-1. His charisma and humor made Ball a fan-favorite antagonist, with Simon reprising the role in the 2008 Stargate SG-1 movie Continuum. He continued to excel in guest appearances on various TV series and films, including a Best Guest Star nomination for the hit show Castle. In 2020, Simon's show Into the Unknown premiered on the Travel Channel, showcasing his adventurous spirit and love for the paranormal. He served as both a host and executive producer. Under the title Uncharted Mysteries, the show's first season had already aired on the History Channel in Europe. When not immersed in work, Simon embraced his love for the outdoors, frequently kiteboarding with dolphins off Malibu's beaches or surfing the waves, maintaining a peaceful and balanced lifestyle. But his love for the outdoors culminated in a heart-wrenching tragedy that robbed the world of this unbelievably talented man. On the 9th of March, 2021, Simon set out to go kiteboarding in Topanga, California. 
Kiteboarding or kite surfing is a sport that involves using wind power with a large power kite to pull a rider across a water, land, or snow surface. It combines aspects of paragliding, surfing, wind surfing, skateboarding, snowboarding, and wakeboarding. Kiteboarding is among the less expensive and more convenient sailing sports and is considered a pretty safe water sport. The biggest danger with kiteboarding is the unpredictability of the wind. If you're overpowered, meaning a really strong wind and a kite too large, the risk of getting lofted high into the air increases. Once lofted, you can be carried a considerable distance and crash into boats, rock walls, parked cars, houses, trees, and even power lines. According to his wife, the beach was Simon's temple, a place he would go to clear his head. He had been a windsurfer and water skier instructor and was a strong swimmer. However, on this day, nature would turn against him. There are not too many details that have been released on the tragic events that occurred, but it's speculated that a harsh wind caught Simon's kite and led to a horrific crash that took his life. Cliff Simon died at the age of 58 after living a life filled with adventure, thrills, and passion. His wife, Colette Simon, commented after his death. As he said, acting is what I do. It's only a part of who I am. And he was so much more, a true original, an adventurer, a sailor, swimmer, dancer, actor, and author. There's a gaping hole where he once stood on this earth. He was loved by too many to mention and had a great impact on so many lives. If you're a fan of rallying and drifting cars, then you've likely heard about Ken Block. Even if you didn't know him, you've probably seen his insane drifting stunts floating around the internet. Not only did he co-found DC Shoes, he also took rallying to extreme heights with his Gymkhana series of extreme stunts. Born on November 21st, 1967, Block's journey began as a professional rally driver and co-founder of DC Shoes. His legacy as a daring precision driver will forever leave people in awe. In 2005, Block embarked on his national rallying career with Vermont Sports Car, driving a 2005 Subaru WRX STI. Throughout his rallying career, he consistently pushed the boundaries of the sport and showcased exceptional driving skills. Notable highlights include his performances at events like Snowdrift, Rally America, and the Global Rallycross Championship. While Block's racing prowess was undeniable, he's perhaps best known for his groundbreaking Gymkhana video series, which featured precision stunts that seemed to defy the laws of physics. His unbelievable talent leaves viewers glued to the screen, delighting us with beautiful slow-motion drifting scenes. One of his most unforgettable moments involved drifting right in front of a moving train, leaving us in awe of his fearlessness and precision. Block's talents extended beyond the world of rallying and stunt driving. As a versatile athlete, he also competed in various action sports, including skateboarding, snowboarding, and motocross. This passion for adrenaline-fueled activities eventually led him to co-found Hoonigan Industries, an apparel brand dedicated to auto enthusiasts. In addition to his work with Hoonigan, Block continued to evolve his Gymkhana series, with each new installment featuring more incredible stunts and jaw-dropping locations. Gymkhana 9, for instance, showcased some of Block's most dangerous stunts, such as performing high-speed maneuvers in a hatchback through the streets of Buffalo, New York. Ken Block's relentless pursuit of innovative driving experiences solidified his status as a modern-day rally showman. With his daring nature, you would think that Block would have passed while attempting a crazier stunt than he had ever done before. Unfortunately, his death came at a time no one expected. On the 2nd of January, 2023, Block set out with a group of friends to ride snowmobiles near his ranch in Woodland, Utah. At some point during the day, Block became separated from the rest of the group. Tragedy struck while Block was navigating a steep slope. While snowmobiling the hill, his center of gravity shifted and the entire snowmobile tipped over, with the massive 500-pound machine landing directly on top of him. The other riders in the group eventually caught up to him and found the horrific scene. At 2 p.m., the Wasatch County Sheriff's Office received a call about the accident and released this statement shortly after. The driver, Kenneth Locke, a 55-year-old male out of Park City, Utah, was riding a snowmobile on a steep slope when the snowmobile upended, landing on top of him. He was pronounced deceased at the scene from injuries sustained in the accident. He's survived by his wife, Lucy, and his daughter, Leah Block, who's continuing his legacy of rallying. After the accident, she said, 
Yesterday, I didn't just lose my father, I lost my best friend. He was truly my whole world, and the only person I ever looked up to. No matter what I did, he was always there to support me. The final celebrity tragedy on our list rocked the entire world. I remember hearing about his death when I was nine years old, and everyone was talking about it. His contributions to the environment will never be forgotten, and he taught and inspired people from everywhere. This is none other than the late, great Steve Irwin, otherwise known as the Crocodile Hunter. If you've been living under a rock and haven't heard of him, he was an Australian conservationist, zookeeper, television personality, and wildlife educator with an infectious personality that made him a beloved face all around the world. His love for nature and the environment still continues to inspire people to this day. The charity he created, Wildlife Warriors, bought up hundreds of square miles around the world for wildlife conservation. It still operates today and is also involved in conservation for animals like koalas, Cambodian elephants, Sumatran tigers, and many more. No matter what, Steve Irwin's efforts to protect the world will continue to have a knock-on effect, even though it has been almost 20 years since his untimely demise. It was the 4th of September, 2006. Irwin and his film crew were at Bat Reef near Port Douglas in Queensland, shooting an underwater documentary called Ocean's Deadliest. Thanks to some bad weather, there was a hold on filming, so Irwin decided to do some snorkeling and shoot some footage for his daughter Bindi's television program. Irwin had a rule that no matter what happens, filming always continues. As he was floating in the shallow waters, he came dangerously close to a short tail stingray. He approached it to film it swimming away, but the six foot seven inch stingray became frightened. What followed was so terrible that the footage has never been released, and it was reportedly destroyed. It is one of the only recordings of a stingray ever attacking a human. The short tail stingray turned aggressive and started attacking Irwin with its sharp tail. It's estimated that the stingray stabbed Irwin close to a hundred times in a matter of seconds. Severe damage was done to his chest and thoracic region, too severe for Steve Irwin to recover from. The crew rushed to his rescue, but there was simply too much damage for anything to be done. Justin Lyons, the man filming the incident, said to Steve, I was saying to him things like, think of your kid, Steve, hang on. Hang on, hang on. And he calmly looked up at me and said, I'm dying. And that was the last thing he said. Steve Irwin was only 44 years old at the time of his death. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Stay bold and live brave.